Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 15th, 2019, and my guest is philosopher, economist, and author Arthur Diamond. He's the author of Openness to Creative Destruction, Sustaining Innovative Dynamism, which is our subject for today. Art, welcome to Econ Talk. I'm looking forward to our conversation, Russ. Let's start with your view of creative destruction. Uh, describe what it is and why we should be open to it. When I think about creative destruction, I think first about uh, a phrase that Deirdre McCloskey used in her uh, trilogy, bourgeois trilogy. The, she talked about the great fact of economic history. And I like that phrase because uh, it gets you on the edge of your chair thinking, okay, what is, so, yeah, what is going to be the great fact? What is it? And it turns out that what she's talking about is that for tens of thousands of years, people like us, homo sapiens, lived lives that were poor, nasty, brutish, and short, to use Hobbes' phrase. And then something spectacular happened, the great fact, somewhere around 250 years ago. The lives of many people, at first in, in Europe mainly, but then throughout the world, got substantially better. And that's just a blink of an eye in terms of the whole history of, of beings like us. And so that raises – the great fact raises the great question, which is how do you explain the great fact? And the way that I think the great fact is best explained is, uh, is starting with Schumpeter, the idea of creative destruction. Schumpeter has this great book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And uh, he wrote it after he was depressed that what he thought was going to be his great book was not well received and everybody was reading Keynes. So he then wrote this off. And in the seventh chapter, that's the key chapter where he talks about creative destruction. And, and one of the, the, the goals he has is to try to say in the whole book, uh, especially this middle part of the book, is to say that capitalism has been uh, misportrayed, that it is the force in the world that makes ordinary people's lives better. And he says that, that capitalism has uh, the key, the essential fact of capitalism is creative destruction. Creative destruction is the process through which old ways of doing things are replaced by new things. The creative part is the car. The destructive part is that carriages go away. I mean, the, great, the, the creative part is the plow, uh, the me mechanized plow. The destructive part is the wooden plow goes away. And you can go example after example. Um, I use that phrase in, in my book, in the title of my book. It's not my favorite way of describing what he's talking about. And I don't know if this is the time to get into that, but McCloskey, when she talked about writing, one of the points she made was that you should always put at the end of a piece of writing what matters most, what you want to emphasize. So if you're talking about a sentence, the last word is what should matter. If you're talking about a book, the last chapter you put what what most matters. And so the phrase creative destruction, what's, in, what's last in that phrase is destruction. <laughs> and one of the things I learned as I was working on this project, um, and it, it was one of the things that I found most exciting about the process of doing this book, was that the creative, the creative part of the process has, hasn't been emphasized enough. It's been underestimated. And the destructive part has been overestimated. Uh, what I found was people are afraid of losing jobs, and some jobs are lost, but not as much as people think. And the jobs that, that replace them are much better jobs. So whereas people are afraid of the destructive part because they, they don't understand that, they, they should uh, – if they, if, they, if they saw a more realistic picture of what it is, I don't think they would be quite as afraid. And I'm, I'm saying they shouldn't be quite as afraid. So um, I say openness is important. And the, the openness uh, is in the title because I'm trying I, I, I'm trying to make the case that uh, yes there is some there's a, things could go go wrong for some people, but not as often or as bad as most people think, and that the benefits are huge, the costs aren't as great, uh, and I think openness 
or gives us great benefits in terms of the quality of the jobs we have, in terms of the goods we get, in terms of how long and comfortable life is, but also in terms of an area that I don't think has been sufficiently emphasized, which is in terms of the quality of the work we're able to do. And I think work's an important part of life. So uh, that that would be my first pass, I, I guess, is answering that question. So that, that, I want to say a couple things about first, I think I, sure. I disagree with Deirdre that it should be uh, the last word in the last paragraph in the last page in the last chapter um, should be the most important thing because a lot of people don't get to that last chapter in the modern era. <laughs> so I go the other way. It's the first paragraph that's the most important, but I get her, I take her point and I think your observation about destruction as being overemphasized is I think extremely unfortunate. I think there are two things about the process of creative destruction that, that are misunderstood, that are extremely, extremely uh, important. One is it, it's crucial to remind us that life is not a zero-sum game. And I think our natural intuition is often that it, that it is. And so I think it's extremely valuable that that phrase conjures up some idea of churning or, or uh, of vitality. So that's the first thing. Uh, I, there is the risk, though, that I think people misunderstand it to mean, well, some things come along and some things go away. And that's really a misunderstanding of the positive sum aspect of, of the process that you're, that, you're, um, that you're writing about. The other thing I think that's important, and I'm, I don't know if you spent enough time on this book for my taste and just personal <laughs> uh, taste of mine, is that I don't think people understand easily the connection between the creative and the destruction and that it's actually creative destruction, creative, <laughs> creative destruction, creative destruction. That there's a – it's not a cycle but a, an ongoing process by which – by allowing things to disappear, we free up the resources, both human and financial, that allow new things to come along. And I think some people just sort of assume – well, when some jobs go away, well, I guess, yeah, I guess it's good fortune that some jobs do come to replace them. But the actual process by which the jobs are destroyed, the companies that die, the resources that are no longer devoted to their products, is exactly what allows the new jobs to come along. And I think that isn't fully appreciated. Well, I, I agree with that. Although the creative process by creating more stuff means you don't have to do as much reallocation as you might think. You still have to reallocate. That's part of the process. So I agree with that. I do want to comment briefly on what you said at the beginning, though, if I may, which is about people uh, think of the process as being a zero-sum game. And that is also something I, I talk about a little bit in the book and, and maybe should have talked about more. One of the things I, I try to do in the book and uh, like about the parts where I succeeded is I try to give a lot of examples and compelling stories that I that illustrate the points that I'm trying to make. And on the on the point of the zero sum game, my favorite uh, I think the favorite story is about um, Brunelleschi and uh, Ghiberti, mm -hmm. the two uh, uh, greats of uh, the Florentine Renaissance, where they were competing to uh, for they, there was a prize established. To see who would get to to, to uh, design and 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 make these brass panels for the doors of the new cathedral, and, uh, and they that had was a actually competition. sorry to correct you, but it's I think it's sure. the baptistry. It's related you know, to the cathedral. Absolutely correct me because I, <laughs> I you're you're hugely better at that on those sorts of issues. So I should have I should have asked you rather than, than say the wrong thing. Uh, I've seen them, but I don't know how to what to call them. Um, but, uh, uh, so they were, they, they had this competition with, a, and, they, and a lot of people competed, but the judges thought both Ghiberti and Brunelleschi had done a, a wonderful job. And so they said, we don't know what to do here. We're, we're going to make you guys, uh, you guys can each do half of the panels. And Brunelleschi was, uh, was appalled and said, well, if I'm not named the winner, I'm not going to do it. So it looks like the way they first look at it is that, that okay, there's a zero-sum game. Ghiberti won, Brunelleschi lost. But what Brunelleschi then did was he, he thought, what other contribution can I make that will be worthwhile in the world? He did a little touring of some of the architectural greats in Rome and other places. And he came back and he competed and won the assignment to build the Duomo. And so the way that I end that story is that uh, in the short run, there are losers, but – 
more often than not, in the long run, everyone can be winners in this process of creative destruction. And uh, that's optimistic, but I think there's a lot of truth to it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, especially when you look across generations, in any one generation, there are people whose fates don't turn out well. The competitive process turns against them. Consumers turn against them. They might lose out on just a change in tastes that has nothing to do with justice it just or their hard efforts. But uh, allowing resources to flow to their most valued use, which is the ideal of a competitive market economy, allows the next generation and much of the current generation to thrive because there's more available. I've I've heard you make that argument, um, and I think it's a it's a it's a, a plausible argument. But I think you can it's you can make a stronger argument. I don't think you have to argue for openness to creative destruction based on yeah you're we're going to put it to you, but your children are going to be better. I think we can say your children are going to be better, and most of the time you're going to be better too. I think if we have a what I call a robustly redundant job market, and there's things we can do to make that more likely then people who lose their jobs will themselves find jobs that are as good or better in their lifetime and not just have to have the hope that their children will be better, which is a reasonable hope to, a reasonable point to make. But I don't. I think we can make the even stronger point that the odds are pretty good that they'll be better off in, in this process. Fair enough. No, I, I agree with that. I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I bring up the next generation for the case where uh, you have a certain, you know, I always use the, um, Work, worker in the auto assembly line in the United States who's put out of work by Americans buying Japanese cars and uh, wants the government to protect their jobs, which is understandable. And their next best alternative after they've invested a long time in a particular skill set may not be very attractive. They may have a diminished standard of living. Uh, but you're right. Many won't. Many people in the spread out through the economy are going to do better while they're alive. I don't mean to suggest it's all about sacrificing for their children. So I think, yeah, I, I totally actually agree with you. Uh, There's a book uh, related to that uh, example that I found compelling uh, called uh, Janesville by Amy Goldstein. And she embedded herself in the Janesville uh, auto plant community when they all lost their jobs. And then she followed several examples of uh, how people did. And there was a lot of suffering in the book. It was not an easy book to read. But those people who are willing to move um, seem to do better than those who stayed and took what was the usual uh, recommendation of the authorities, which is go to the local community college and sign up for one of the training yeah. classes. Yeah, and there's a lot of government money put into that too. They got a special grant and such. And they were training, these people were working real hard to retrain themselves, but the kind of classes they set up, there were like 30 people signing up for a job to, treat, to uh, uh, teach you how to be a, a lineman for the uh, one of the utilities. Well, okay, so they go through the training and they and they get certified, and it turns out maybe there's two jobs available for the 30 linemen, and all these people have put in the time, the money, and the effort, Horrible. and have nothing to show for it. The people who end up doing okay are the people who move. And one of the issues I know you've addressed in some of your other podcasts with others is the issue of why don't we have as much mobility? Yeah. And I think it could be partly the peop the workers who are have lost their jobs are not willing, but I think there's also an element – that there are policies in effect in some of the cities that might be natural magnets that discourage people from coming to hire. And you've talked about that with, um, I don't know if I can pronounce French very well, Alain Berteau. Alain Berteau, yeah. Yeah, he, some of what he said was relevant to that uh, about you know the size of the ha of the of the apartments is is regulated so people who are poor and uh, displaced can't get a foothold. But there's other issues like. Uh, restrictions on vertical uh, building, high, tall buildings, and and the actual expansion of the city geographically over over greater territory. If we, if we had the kind of boom towns that we used to have, you know, the the rate of growth of Chicago was enormous when it was a boom town, in a whole bunch of different dimensions. That would provide a way for people who were displaced, like the people in Janesville, to go to a place where more jobs were more readily available, and there wouldn't be as severe suffering. I believe but, as, as there is. But. I don't mean to correct you because I, yeah. I, I know you, what I'm going to say. Oh, go ahead. What me. I'm going to say next you agree with. But uh -huh. um, when, when we say a phrase like go to Chicago where the jobs are more available, obviously the quote number of jobs is not a fixed number available in Chicago. 
if a large number of people move to Chicago and we're looking for work in a successful, robust economy or job market, and we'll talk about that in a minute, there would be an encouragement of entrepreneurs to start businesses there, to take advantage of that opportunity of a workforce that was looking for work eagerly. So it, it's important to remember it's not, I always use the example of musical chairs. I think people think in, in their mind that there's a fixed number of jobs and when a plant closes, there's just fewer jobs, chairs for people to sit in. Uh, that's not how the labor market works. And I I think uh, you know your point about uh, retraining versus moving um, is extremely important. There's all kinds of different ways that we cope with economic change. And I think both you and I agree that our ability to cope with that doesn't seem to have uh, it seems to have diminished in recent years. And I, let's let's turn to this question about the job market. You can comment. I want to just said if you want, but this issue that uh, that you the United States job market appears to be less mobile, less dynamic, less flexible. Uh, do you think that's true? And why do you think that is? What has changed? Uh, I. I th- the main problem, I think, is that we've increased the level of regulation of the labor market. And uh, a secondary problem is we've increased regulations of those who are the main creators of new jobs. Uh, if you take the uh, – and maybe I should say that I think the second's actually probably has or more important, so let me start with that one. The main one – one of the points I make in my, in my book that uh, is known by some people but I don't think widely enough known – is that the the main creator of new jobs are what are sometimes called the gazelles. And uh, it used to be thought, and what you still hear repeated over and over again, is the main, main creators of new jobs are small firms. So we've got to do things like uh, subsidize and encourage small firms. Well, it turns out the vast majority of small firms are not job creators. They stay small. <laughs> they don't, don't last very long. It's the ones that – it's the new firms. Uh, there's uh, The person who's done res- a lot – whose name is mostly associated with this line of research is a fellow named Haltewanger. And uh, he has a variety of co-authors and has written a bunch of papers. But what he finds is it's not small that matters. It's young and fast growing and hence the, the name Gazelle. And so when there was a slowness in job creation after the – especially after the crisis of 2008, um, one plausible speculation – I don't know how much it was – I didn't look into it further except to – Say that, yeah, that, that's something somebody should look into. But one plausible speculation was that the gazelles were were not being – there weren't as many gazelles being created as there had been in the past so that the job creation was slowing because these firms were not – there were fewer of them. There is some, there's evidence that, that, that that's the case. And so if you want to encourage a robustly redundant labor market, one one key one key thing you need to do is think about what's constraining these uh, – fast-growing entrepreneurial startups from doing their thing. And and uh, I th- I believe that one aspect of that is that we overregulate uh, innovative startups. But then there's also the fact of, okay, when, when you do have, let's say when you do have a gazelle, how many people are they going to hire to do whatever they're doing? And one issue that comes into effect is, is are they, this is a big issue? This is a big issue today in policy debates. Are they going to put a robot in there, or a, are they going to put an uh, algorithm, or are they going to put a human being in? Well, if you have the more you regulate the labor market, the more the incentive is for what gazelles exist to think about perhaps seeing can we automate this? Can we cut down on the expensive, inflexible labor, human labor, and have something that that uh, isn't it's not as regulated is not as expensive so i think there's two there's two factors there's that the two things we could do we could reduce the regulation the labor market and we could reduce the regulations on the gazelles and if we did both of those we would have a good shot at making the labor market closer to this ideal that i'm that i'm advocating you know i'm sympathetic to that of course as as listeners would expect but i think the challenge to make that viewpoint more convincing is to get into the trenches, which I don't expect you to get into every trench, or you've gotten to some other trenches here we'll talk about, which I think are great. But you have to get into the trenches and explain why it's gotten harder. What what particular? It's easy to say there's more regulation. I think there is, but how much more? And is it really binding? Does it really make it just that much harder? Um, 
you know, I give a counter view might be, uh, and I thought about this a lot as I was reading your book. And I'm just let me step back for a minute and talk about your mentioning before that you tell a lot of stories in this book. And I think they're fabulous. Um, and in particular, you honor a lot of great people who came up with brilliant things that made people's lives better. And um, we don't know their names, most of us. And I think that's fascinating that that I know a lot more baseball players than I do inventors and entrepreneurs. And I could name a lot more athletes and entertainers and others, and they're fine. But it's interesting that they're not outside of a handful of folks like Steve Jobs or uh, Walt Disney um, or Henry Ford. We don't know many of the names of the people who who changed our lives for the better. And I think that's just that's just a side note. But one thing that struck well, me well, it's is, a really a really really important side note. Yeah, I don't think it's irrelevant. I, I, I don't. Yeah. yeah, I don't. It's no, not. I, just I, a, I wouldn't mind. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I know that's not the main point you're going to make. Go ahead. Make, interrupt, I, go ahead. I, I wouldn't mind talk. Well, yeah, talk about that at some point. Well. One of the things that I think is a, another kind of bum, bum rap on, on entrepreneurial capitalism or what I call innovative dynamism is the idea that people, people are debating now more, more and more about oh, should we be in favor of socialism or should we be in favor of capitalism. And one of the things you hear is that socialism is, the, uh, uh, is where the idealists go. And uh, the practical people go with uh, with uh, capitalism. And there's a famous saying that gets repeated. I don't know who it's due to originally. You know that when anyone who's uh, not a socialist when they're young doesn't have a heart, anyone who's still a socialist when they're old doesn't have a brain, something like that. Yeah. Well, I think that's selling the capitalist side short because it implies that we can't be idealistic, that we're just kind of number crunchers. Uh, and part of what I think people don't understand is that that that. These people who are responsible for innovative dynamism, the inventors, the entrepreneurs, and some of the venturesome consumers that I think especially get short shrift, that these people are heroes in many ways. They're not perfect. They're, for, they're, they're flawed human beings, but, they, but heroes are flawed, but they're people who do great things in spite of their flaws. And I think that uh, one of the, some of the accounts we give, and including economists, maybe we – well, I – not just including economists, maybe even mainly economists, is we've taken the entrepreneur out of our accounts of capitalism. You can read a lot of good textbooks of, of micro without too much uh, emphasis on, on entrepreneurship. Maybe just a little aside in some box somewhere, but it's not part of the core message. Yep. And I want to make it part of my core message is that this system, that's why I have as a second chapter, uh, I, I emphasize entrepreneurs the innovative entrepreneur. And I want to say that it's, this is not inevitable. This process isn't inevitable. This is a process that is driven by human beings and their choices and their perseverance and their courage. And I think if that message got out more, it'd be harder to make this case that one side's got a monopoly on idealism because I don't think that's true. I think that's a bum rap. I totally agree with that. Uh, we need a lot more idealism. I've often said we need an anthem for free markets. Um, <laughs> my Kansak rap videos with John Popola, particularly the second one, is something of a defense of that kind. But um, the next one you do have have have, have Schumpeter and Keynes. Yeah, that. there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, Schumpeter would be a. It's not a bad idea actually. Uh, plus, you could bring in a lot of other aspects about his personality. Um, you know, supposedly he wanted, I think, to be the greatest economist, the greatest lover, and the greatest horseman, and he got two out of three. But anyway, I think I don't know if that was his self assessment <laughs> or the assessment of others. Um, anyway, they, they, they said that uh, uh, the economist once said that economists are boring people, that the only uh, two people that you could make a good movie about who are economists were uh, Keynes and uh, <laughs> and Schumpeter. Yeah, that and could be I true. Don't know if but they, they left out the one that was actually done, the uh, Nash, although I don't know if you count him as an economist. No, but anyway, I interrupted you. You were going to go a different direction. Yeah, I want to go back to my other point, which is that we're talking about the dynamics of the labor market, how much due to regulation. And I, as an aside, which derailed us. I mentioned how I think how un how we don't idolize or glory uh, glorify uh, great entrepreneurs and inventors, and I think that's a shame. But the the other point I want to make is that you could argue, besides the I think the need to get in the trenches and show why, in particular, it's harder to create a gazelle and not just say there's more regulation or there's more pages in the Federal Register. I think you need to show. Uh, maybe something akin to Hernando de Soto's work. Like, are there more permits you need? Is it that once you reach 30 or 50 employees, a certain set of regulations kick in? 
And there are people who've done that. I don't mean to suggest it hasn't been done, but I think to make that case, you have to go down that path to some extent. But the other point I want to make is that in reading your the narratives of, of many of the great entrepreneurs and innovators that you, that you chronicle, one is struck by how little they had when they got to America, say, how low their station was when they started, and how through dint of hard work and creativity and drive and stamina and grit, they managed to create a great product and a great successful enterprise that employed hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. And I wonder, that's harder to do today. I think you'd agree. And then the question is, is that because the rules and regulations of running and starting a business have changed? Or is it because the nature of what is going to be done today is different? So let me explain. I think right now there's tremendous innovation where I'm sitting, sitting at Stanford where I am for the summer and within a 50 mile radius, there's an, just an extraordinary profusion of funding and creativity and enterprise. And it's, um, it's an amazing time to be alive in this area or to come to this area and be part of this transformation. And it's been that way for a decade or two and it might continue. But it's also clear that there's a set of hurdles that a person has to clear to get here. And I don't mean physically, I mean intellectually, creativity wise. Um, the skills that you have to have aren't the same skills that it took to create uh, a great enterprise in 1880. It's uh, much more technical. The number of people who are capable of do doing it might be a lot smaller. It, might, it requires a, an educational background. It's true that you don't have to go to college to get that educational background. You'd have to figure it out for yourself or learn it online, or, but it's not undemanding. And I just wonder if how, some of the slowing of the pace of innovation in the rest of the economy outside Silicon Valley uh, is, is not unrelated to what's already been done. And what remains here that is dynamic is dependent on a certain small group of people who have the capability to use the tools that are, that are quite demanding. Well, you know, this may be an example of something that I think we do uh, naturally enough, but that we should restrain ourselves from doing, which is to overgeneralize uh, from Silicon Valley about what might be true of entrepreneurship in general. And it's natural to do that because in our time, by far the most dramatic successes uh, are in Silicon Valley. And so when I, when I was writing the book, a lot of my examples are Silicon Valley. That's what's available and that's what is compelling. But uh, – and I think – Again, I can't prove it, and you're right. It'd be better to drill down and be able to prove it rather than just say this is suggestively plausible, but that's all I've got at the moment. I think that part of the reason why we've got the spectacular success in Silicon Valley but not so much elsewhere is because there had been, and, uh, and maybe still is but maybe won't be for long, less regulation of what's going on in Silicon Valley compared to other areas. And uh, that's why I try to find other examples of areas where – uh, there's there's dramatic uh, entrepreneurship that's not Silicon Valley. I, I talk a little bit in the book about the fracking entrepreneurial entrepreneurship. Yep, great and example. these are people these are people who are very different from the uh, Silicon Valley and don't have to have some of the characteristics that you are sketching as being entry tickets to getting into Silicon Valley. And I think you could have more people in more areas of entrepreneurship. And uh, who wouldn't be required to have all you know the coding skills and the high education level that Silicon Valley uh, needs? Uh, if if we had more, if we had less regulation, I mean, I, I give I give some examples in the book. I don't. You, you, what you I think would be looking for is if somehow uh, the people who do the reg data at George Mason or or some group like that, if they could fine tune their their stats to judge whether there was something that changed when we had the drop in entrepreneurship uh, in the gazelles after 2008. And I'm, I certainly, I'm to accept I think that would be neat if they do that. I haven't tried to do that or asked Patrick McLaughlin and those guys whether they whether they can do it or not. But that that would be good. I do have a few examples where on, where regulation has a, has has uh, affected entrepreneurship, 
Um, one of the ones I like a lot because it's it, it's an example that people like Tyler Cowen and uh, and uh, Peter Thiel have made a big deal of and are quoted on. One of the things they say is, you know, where are the flying cars that we were promised uh, when uh, you and I, Russell, were young, I mean, the Jetsons and all of that? And they say uh, you know, that, that they have their reasons for why they don't think we have the flying cars. In, in the book, I have a brief vignette of somebody who was actually – had an entrepreneurial startup to make a flying car, and he complains about all the regulatory hurdles that have slowed him down so much in in developing that. Uh, and and you you know there's other individual cases where you can see that there's been a lot in the papers, and then there's also a nice uh, kind of academic paper by John Chisholm where he's looked at drones and how drones were originated here in the United States, but a lot of the innovations now taken is being taken to other places because of. Uh, the regulatory obstacles we have here in the United States. I mean, one of, one of my absolute favorite examples in my book is one of the regulations that I don't think they still have this. Maybe they've taken it off. But one of the regulations they had is that there had to be an operations manual on board in every drone, <laughs> <laughs> which raises a lot of questions. Yeah, there's a lot there. That's a rich um, mind um, yeah. load to mine. But I actually want to defend your book um, uh Make sure the listeners don't misunderstand. I don't think your book is particularly Silicon Valley heavy at all. In fact, I was struck by how many interesting examples of innovation that came from the turn of the century, turn of the twentieth century, and pre um, the pre high tech world. Um, containers, uh, Standard Oil, uh, automobile uh, production, the production process itself. I think there, there's a lot of wonderful. Uh, examples that you give that I think are important to give people an appreciation of the dynamism that, that you're trying to talk about. And I want to now, this is even crazier though, I want to defend, uh, I want to argue against my claim about regulation. You know, I think okay. some of the, uh, if I think about the people I've talked to on the program, uh, Eric Topol particularly comes to mind about, say, the health field. There's so many extraordinary things that could be done in health. It would be done in health if government's hand was not uh, all wrapped around every single aspect of it. One of the things that drives me crazy is when people say, well, we know markets won't work well with healthcare. I mean, look how horrible the U.S. healthcare market is. Well, the U.S. healthcare market is, uh, the, you know, it's just, it's not anything. Rem to say it's not like, a free, it's not a free market is, is almost comic. I even, even have to say that. It's highly subsidized. The prices are distorted. The prices are often set by government. Uh, except in the areas where they're not, like pharmaceuticals, where they're just left to run free and, and pharmaceutical companies may have an easier time uh, getting money from taxpayers without their consent. So I, I just um, – I think when we think about the areas of the economy we care a lot about, the other one I would emphasize would be education. The opportunities to be innovative in these two areas are – it's not like there's a regulation that that got passed in, in – on April 7th and signed into law in 2017 or wherever, whenever it's that it's just hard to get anything started. There's just, it's so complex. There's so many difficulties in getting to the consumer and that the consumer is not the uh, patient in the case of healthcare, I think is, is really the ultimate problem. Well, I don't know if you uh, uh, noticed that uh, I totally agree with you. Because where I placed – what I placed at the end of the book is uh, a discussion of an example from healthcare. Yep. And I was trying to save my big uh, – according to your view of things, I should have put it at the beginning. <laughs> but uh, my, my agreeing with McCluskey has me putting it at the end. I hope people last to get that far. <laughs> and I, you got me worried now that I may have made the wrong decision. Yeah, but, good stories at the beginning the, too, Art. Don't worry about well, it. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I talk at the end about uh, cancer. And uh, try to set, illustrate some of the messages of the early part of the book by looking at who were the sorts of people and what were the obstacles faced by the people who brought us some gains against cancer. And the, the idea being that if we learn from that, we can uh, reduce regulations and, and uh, have a situation where we get more cures faster and, and longer lives. Um, I... I uh, I don't know if you want me to sketch any of that, but I, yeah, it ahead. turns out that yeah, they, the uh, they, I, I go through some of the sort of the, the stars of this process and what they were doing. Part of what I what I talk about in early in the book 
uh, without talking about so much the health examples, but other examples, is I say, okay, what, how are entrepreneurs thinking? How are they acting? What's the process of innovative entrepreneurship? And I say there's – I have a section called – uh, kind of pompously, I suppose, using a huge Latin word, the epistemology of entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. where, I, where I'm, I'm trying to say, okay, how, how do they think? And I focus on three aspects. One is they often uh, benefit from and make use of serendipitous occurrences, and they often uh, have what uh, Stephen Johnson called, I think, well, uh, slow hunches, where they have sort of a vague idea that they have to mull over and sharpen over a long period of time. And they also do nimble trial and error experiments where they're not sure exactly where it's going to go or how long it'll take till they reach their conclusion. And I give illustrations of that in the second chapter. But then some of that is repeated again. Some of those same uh, characteristics are important to the big advances uh, over cancer that I talk about at the end of the last chapter. Uh, for instance, in terms of the serendipity, in World War I, mustard gas was unfortunately used against some of the soldiers, and, and they suffered a lot. But there was a benefit that came for, to medicine from that because when people investigated the effects of the mustard gas, they saw that – some of them saw that there were effects on red blood cells. And then a later set of researchers thought about that, scratched their head and said, hey, if that happened through this horrible uh, part of World War I, maybe there's some way we could harness that when we actually do have cells, in other words, cancerous blood cells, that we want to get rid of. And that started – that was one of the sort of jump starts or inspirations for chemotherapy. So then uh, the next, one of the next big steps was a guy named Sidney Farber, and uh, Farber was somebody who uh, was looking for uh, some kind of chemical that, he, that would uh, 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 improve, uh, cure the blood of children with leukemia. And he had noticed that, there, that for some diseases where people weren't making red blood cells, uh, enough of them, they were able to be improved by being given uh, folic acid. So he tried that, uh, and his peers were already skeptical of it. He tried that, and it turned out the children died faster. The leukemia the leukemia was accelerated, not stopped. And he just about got shot down by his peers when that happened. And you can understand that, right? Sure. Instead of helping the children, the children were worse off. But fortunately, he was able to hold on. I mean, they took away all of his support staff. He was doing all the steps of the research himself. They were giving him facilities underneath the stairs and right by the restrooms. But he was able to hold on. And so then he scratched his head and said, okay, if this accelerates it, maybe, some, maybe there's something that's the opposite of folic acid that would stop it. So he had one of his friends, an introvert who hadn't gotten tenure at Harvard, uh, but who's really good at making chemicals to, to order. He said, can you find something that is kind of the opposite of folic acid that, that hooks onto the same places but doesn't have the same effects? And they came up with it, he came up with this drug. And he gave that to the children, the next set of children, unfortunately, the next set. But, uh, but it, and, and it, it resulted in remissions. And that was, a, that was wonderful, except it was short, a few months. But they got a few months more, and it was proof of concept. It showed that this, is a poly, this can work. What he was doing, though, he was, it wasn't easy. It was trial and error. It was taking use, making some use of this original serendipitous event, it was sticking with a hunch that this could be done. The next step was, uh, there were other intermediate steps, but there was, there was a, a guy named uh, Freireich and his team um, decided, let's take some of these chemicals like the, uh, an, the uh, uh, antagonist to folic acid that, that had been used by Farber. Let's take some of these chemicals, put them together in a combination and maybe the combination will have some effect. And his, their colleagues, they were a, a real. They were sometimes called cowboys. One cynic, uh, when he was viewing the meetings, they used to have weekly meetings. The committee to decide what chemicals to put in and what doses to use. One one person, one uh, a wag said, "That's that's the society of jabbering idiots." Uh, hearing them yell at each other and grab the chalk from each other, and and but what happened was they actually started to cure childhood leukemia in some cases, not just remission, but to cure it. The way they did it was by these weekly meetings, making adjustments, seeing how things were going and trying nimble trial and error experiments, the same kind that I talk about in that second chapter. And uh, one of the young cynics, friend of the guy who said Society of Jabbering Idiots, he was attending the meetings just for entertainment. He thought these guys were foolish. But after a while, he kept going and he said, you know, 
he thought it suddenly occurred to him, I'm not going to these meetings because I'm being entertained anymore. I'm going to these meetings because these people are curing cancer. So the guy named Vince DeVita. And uh, DeVita started working on this program, and he chose another disease, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and used the same trial and error techniques to come up with a chemical uh, cocktail that had success in some cases with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and curing it. Now, he's written a passionate, wonderful book um, that talks a lot of autobiographical interesting stuff about his earlier life. But the last chapters, he talks about policies to encourage faster, quicker, uh, better cures of more people for more diseases, especially in the area of cancer, which he knows best. And what he says is the current policies of the Food and Drug Administration are – blocking the kind of process that succeeded in curing cancer in the past. So what you have to do now is you have to have a protocol that's approved by the FDA. The protocol, you have to say what you're going to do, and you have to stick with it throughout the trial. Well, that's not what Freireich was doing when he cured childhood leukemia. That's not what DeVita himself was doing when he cured Hodgkin's diploma. They were making the kind of nimble trial and error that in general, that very often is what entrepreneurs do. So he, he at the end says... And he's somebody who spent a good bit of his time working for the government. He's not somebody, you know, like a true, true blue core uh, libertarian who would, you know, never contemplate that. But he's saying this is one aspect where the government is really losing, uh, causing people to lose their lives unnecessarily. And uh, he makes a very strong case that uh, they need to take account of how progress has been made in the past. Now you might say, okay, well, this might have been just a a special case, the case of chemotherapy. We've now moved on to some other therapies that people think are going to be less, have less side effects and uh, more promise. They're now, people are excited about immunotherapies. But you also look at some of the main people who've been doing the immunotherapy work. Uh, somebody like uh, uh, Steven Rosenberg wrote a book several years ago called The Transformed Cell about his early work trying to get immunotherapy to work. And he's got passages in that book where he talks about how much he was slowed down and sometimes slowing down isn't just a matter of the time. He had certain cells he needed to inject in people, but he had to get approval from the FDA, and the FDA wasn't getting approval. And if you wait long enough, then those cells are no longer usable to do what he wanted to do. And he talked about how much it slowed down his progress in immunotherapy. He's finally beginning to get results after decades. Just now, he started to get some, some more positive results than he'd ever been able to get before. But he said not only did it slow him down, but it was enormously demoralizing. Just the science of what he was trying to do was so hard. That's enough to tire a person out and, and to get him discouraged occasionally. But then in addition, he had to go down and fight this bureaucracy. And uh, you wonder how many people – he stuck with it. And there are people who will stick with it no matter what. No, I, but I you know. also got to think how many people are there out there who would be curing things for us who just give up at some point. And uh, so I think you are absolutely right. Part of the reason I emphasize health so much – is that some of the some of the benefits of creative destruction, of innovative dynamism that I emphasize, I think I make a really strong case, like for automobiles, for air conditioning, for uh, uh, video games. But reasonable people can disagree with those. I haven't found very many people who are in favor of cancer. And so it seems to me like this is an extremely powerful, important case. And uh, I think I think it can be made very strongly that in this case, the regulation has uh, has had huge harms on a lot of people. I'm going to put a twist on that because I, oh. although I sort of agree, I agree for probably a different reason maybe than you do. Um, you and I both came to the University of Chicago. We we're both, I think, trained to believe that the FDA kills people because they uh, make it harder to get stuff approved. And I, <clears throat> until recently, I was that was sort of the end of the story for me. Um, but the more I've thought about the way we've structured healthcare. And it's sort of a meta argument about the cost of regulation, I guess. Or I wouldn't call it regulation. I would call it the cost of the way government structured the healthcare market. Basically, what we've done is we've said um, we're going to highly subsidize it through Medicare, Medicaid, and the employer uh, subsidized via tax breaks of uh, insurance. We're going to highly subsidize it. Uh, we're, gonna, we're going to create a legal environment. Where if you do not pursue best care, you're you're vulnerable to to suit, and um, everybody expects to get the best treatment available without having to pay for it, of course, because that's immoral according to many. So what that does is it creates a way, as I alluded to a little bit way back, for 
players in the medical field to put their hands in taxpayers' pockets without the consent of taxpayers to benefit sometimes, but not always. Sometimes it doesn't benefit, but the consumer is the so-called consumer, which the patient doesn't have as much skin in the game as they normally would. And this, the entity with the most skin in the game, of course, is the taxpayer, but we're busy and we're not paying a lot of attention, but the people who are paying attention are deeply uh, committed to paying attention because they have skin in the game to make the money. So those are the two people with skin in the game. We don't realize that as taxpayers, or we're too, it's too complicated a process, but the, the other folks are deeply focused. The people who make the devices, who come up with the pharmaceuticals, they are wisely uh, paying a lot of attention. In that world, uh, you can't allow stuff to just be innovated uh, the way it normally would in a normal market because a tiny improvement is going to get uh, approved by hospitals, which are not really competitive. Uh, and as a result, uh, well, the world we live in now is the world where we spend too much, in my view, on healthcare with not enough return because of the incentives that the players in the system have. And the FDA is kind of a mixed bag. It's a bit of a break. It, it's a restrainer of unneeded, unnecessary, not sufficiently good uh, interventions. It's not very good at that, but it does do that a little bit. But as a result, of course, it, the downside of that is that it kills off a lot of potential innovations that would, that would normally take place. Well, I think you're giving too much credit to the FDA. Uh, I think that part of the reason we have so many not very good innovations is due to the, the, what, uh, uh, some of the processes of the uh, 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 FDA. For instance, um, they mandate – uh, a very expensive kind of research is the only kind of uh, research that will uh, be accepted as knowledge of the uh, effectiveness of drugs. They they are they mandate the uh, randomized double blind uh, uh, research, and my view clinical is that, trials. that clinical trials exactly. And and these are extremely expensive to uh, run, yep. and they also uh, I mean they favor the incumbents. And the incumbents, or so I argue uh, in the rest of the book, are not as likely to do the breakthrough innovations for a variety of reasons. So if the only people who can make it through the screen of the FDA's uh, methodology are the big incumbents, that's going to result in a lot of small, unimportant, in general, uh, innovations. I think that part of what you ought to do is uh, say that venturesome consumers can be venturesome if they – this is a, something that I saw in, um, an interview with Milton Friedman a couple of years before he passed away, and, and he was asked about the FDA, and he was not very enthused about it. I mean, way back when it was at Wabash, Ben Rogie brought Friedman down, and he asked him if you press – there was a button in front of you, Milton, and that button, if you pushed it, the FDA would just disappear. Would you push that button, Milton? And uh, Milton Friedman got this huge grin on his face, huge grin. And he said, yes, with enthusiasm. But when I saw him interviewed decades later, a couple of years before he passed away, they were asking about it, and he was more restrained. He said, you know, we have to think about what's politically possible. And what he thought was politically possible is that you have the FDA limit itself to uh, uh, evaluating safety but not efficacy. And that would allow yeah, venturesome I, consumers I, I, to I, make more choices. And yeah, that I'm all would be for also that. I'm all for consumers being able to take risk and take dangerous products. The problem is, is that when they're paying for that with my money instead of their own, it's a really destructive system. It encourages innovation that's not necessarily worthwhile relative to the cost because other people are paying for it. That's the problem. Well, why do the other people have to be paying for it? If, if you didn't so let's pay, change if, if that. Hurt, Let's change that, and then we can decide what the FDA is worth having. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think I think people are scared because of how expensive it currently is. They don't want to take the government out of the out of it to go toward a, uh, the kind of system that you're talking about. And part of the problem is that it doesn't have to be so expensive. But people are scared of okay. Do we take that on faith yeah. from you, no, Donovan? Correct. Yeah. Uh, if if you had a free system, there'd be more competition to provide less expensive ways yeah. to do some of the things that we're now doing expensively. There's work by uh, I'm a, there's probably a bunch of people, but the one I'm familiar with is uh, Clayton Christensen, yep. and a couple of other people have have made some plausible suggestions about how many of the costs could come down, and you'd actually get better 
uh, treatment. If you had, let's say, nurse practitioners doing the parts of medicine that have become routine, they would actually be better at those parts that they do over and over again, and it would be less expensive to boot. So you'd have the best of both worlds there. And we have now, we have credentialing issues that keep that from happening and keep the innovation of that sort happening. But I think you You'd, have, you'd also have more drugs that would be more effective. But what we got coming in now is we got these drugs that extend life and not a very pleasant life for maybe three months. Yeah, horrifying. And that costs all of us a huge amount to develop those drugs. It's not clear how much, how much the patients are better off. There was a neat article in the paper that I saw just the last few weeks where there's, uh, they were talking about uh, some new head of one of the drug uh, research uh, efforts – was going to try to focus their, their research on early stage drugs for cancer. And then in the article, they said something that for me was kind of an epiphany because I hadn't thought about it, but it makes sense to me, is that the current setup uh, it, it strongly encourages the development of new drugs for later stage. And the reason is that it's a lot cheaper to do that given how hard it is to do these double-blind clinical randomized trials uh, because people uh, – people will sign up. If they've tried everything else at the end, they'll sign up for a trial for the final stage new drug. Why not? What have they got to lose? Whereas at the early stages, it's harder to get people, if they might get it, then they might not get it, and they haven't tried some of the other uh, uh, drugs. So it's much, plus, one of the big costs is the number of years before you get the drug approved. If you're trying an early stage, these people, just in the normal course of things, are going to last longer. So you won't know the results of the of the new drug until much later, which means it's going to be much more costly to do it under the current procedures. And uh, so the conclusion of this of this article was people wonder, and sometimes people think, well, the reason why we're getting all these little innovations is because we picked all the low hanging fruit or whatever. It, it may, I think that's not the reason here. It seems like the incentives are set up so that that's what we are developing. But that doesn't mean that there aren't something approximating magic bullets out there to be found. It's just that we've set up the, the incentive structure so that th that's not where it makes sense for them to invest their resources. Yeah, I totally, agree and, with, I totally agree with that. And I think the other obvious piece of this is just it's just a lot harder to do an early stage solution. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's much riskier. And given the costs, um, you want to push your resources of, of getting approval. And you're going to push your resources toward a tweak rather than a transformation. And I, I, I actually want to use that to go back to your book, which um, is our subject. Or I know you like your book, so I'm going to go back to it. <laughs> um, it reminds me, uh, one of the themes of the book we haven't talked about, which I really love, is the, this idea that some of the great innovations in history and come from outsiders, people who aren't formally trained, people who are skeptical of the received wisdom. And you quote – uh, Lord Calvin, uh, that apart from balloons, he did not have, quote, the smallest particle of faith in aerial navigation. Uh, and it reminded me of this wonderful quote from um, Gordon McKenzie. He wrote a book called, which I recommend, called Orbiting the Giant Hairball, which is a book on <laughs> corporate, corporate culture and creativity. It's a fabulous book. Um, and he's, he has a chapter in there. And this is the only, I don't know if I've ever quoted this, one of my favorite things. It's the only line of the chapter. Uh, it's a one page, one sentence chapter. Here it is. Orville Wright didn't have a pilot's license. The, I <laughs> the idea that you can change the world without being an expert, without being um, uh, going the way everyone knows is the right way is just extraordinarily important. And, you know, there are examples in my conversation with David Epstein and his book Range about this phenomenon and it's just it's an incredibly important phenomenon in in actual life that problems are often solved by non-experts the challenge is is that non-experts also have really goofy answers that will not solve the problem <laughs> so so i think we have a natural um, skepticism about non-experts but often experts people excuse me non-experts people who or who who go against the received wisdom of the day, those people are often the ones who transform a field. And I, you talk about that a lot. And I think it's really important. Yeah, it's important uh, partly for the regulatory issue, but also on the issue of uh, how do you fund science. Uh, with the regulatory issue, if you think about 
if if you were going to set up a regulatory agency of uh, of human flight, who would be your perfect person to put on the board? Well, you couldn't pick anybody better, could you? Than the most distinguished physicist of that century, which was Lord Kelvin. <laughs> And yet, and yet you had the quote uh, there about uh, him saying the only flight we'd have would be balloons. So the most distinguished scientist of the age was saying it was impossible. So who's going to allow Wilbur Norville to go and risk their lives doing something that the best authorities uh, say can't be done? And so that, I think, is a strong argument uh, for uh, n- not, not regulating these people who have new ideas that seem crazy to us, that go against – the accepted theories of the day. Marconi, what he did was against the theories of the day. It wasn't as dangerous for him personally as it was for Orville and Wilbur, but he went against the physics when he tried to send the uh, uh, telegraph waves across the ocean. But the self-funding issue is important too because uh, it's really hard for people, the more, the more uh, unusual, the more breakthrough the breakthrough is, the harder it's going to be for any entrepreneur to have any expert uh, or a possible funder understand that it's a plausible possible thing. There's a wonderful scene in a play by Aaron Sorkin, I think I've got his name right, called the Farnsworth Invention, where where a Farns, Farnsworth is one of the people given most credit for inventing television. And uh, he is appearing before uh, the community chest. And he's telling them, and they're saying, well, would you, what is it you want money for? And he says, well, I've got this idea for sending video signals through the air. And 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 then these two two people in the community chest, their mouths are open, their eyes are bulging. Like, do we call somebody to, to right, come and him. take yeah. this take this person out and uh, and lock him up? And then he says, and then if it would help any, I found I think I thought of a way to synchronize it uh, with sound. And so the guy says, Oh, you have, have you? <laughs> <laughs> and and when you see that you know we're used to we're used to television it's it's it's, a, it's everyday thing but when you think about how it felt before it existed to hear about somebody thinking they could do it that's a crazy person right yeah, and there have been there were sent there there were thousands of years when it was a crazy person who thought they could fly um, and so uh, it, it's it's an it's just, the point that you're making uh, uh, is is a strong argument for allowing people to accumulate the funds to self-fund because they're the only ones who are going to see that there's a plausible case to be made for pursuing this this innovation. They're going to they're going to have the knowledge and they're going to have the skin in the game. It's a combination, knowledge and skin in the game both to pursue some of these things that if they work are so spectacularly beneficial to us. So it's partly that but it's also partly the regulations. The regulators are never going to know what's possible even if you get the best people you could like Lord Kelvin. I don't want to leave um, without uh, chatting a little bit about Mariana Mazzucato, who's a guest on the program, and she's become associated with this idea that government and government funding is a crucial, uh, plays a crucial role in innovation. I was skeptical of that argument for a variety of reasons, but I'm curious on your take. Well, I th- in general, I think that uh, the government has had a, uh, not a great track record at picking the winners. And uh, I think there's a few cases where the government, by pouring a lot of funding, has achieved a particular goal, particularly when people had a strong sense of mission-orientedness, like with the Manhattan Project. And especially that's true when the fundamental science and the fundamental knowledge that way has already been worked out and, and you don't have to make uh, huge gains that way. But in general, I think that what it does is it takes a lot of resources. There's opportunity cost. If you take tax money and you put it into the projects that the government anoints, that's money that's not left for the Wilbur Wrights or the Marconis or those people who are working in their garage and have a great idea. Because the tax, the money to fund these things doesn't just come out of thin air. And if I'm right that it's these outsiders, these people with these passionate ideas, these people who have experienced the serendipitous that gives them an advantage. If they're the real sources of most innovation, then taking resources from them goes is exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. And the book, I don't, I had to cut out a lot out of the first version of the book. Uh, and I had more on this in, in the penultimate version. But in this version, I have a little uh, that's related to your question. I look at two of the most prominent examples briefly of, uh, for people who advocate the government should be more involved. I look at MIDI, a ministry, international ministry for trade and something in Japan, and also, I look at DARPA a little bit, which was an example in the United States. 
And I think in both those cases, the benefits and uh, the successes have been uh, exaggerated. In the case of MIDI, uh, the two bi big projects that they pushed uh, uh, during their heyday, one was a, a system of high-definition TV that turned out to be inferior to the system that eventually was uh, used. They also were putting a bunch of money into supercomputers. And what they missed, what did they miss when they were doing that? Well, what they missed was personal computers. Uh, so they were putting their bets on these other two things when when the thing that really mattered was something that they had, had ignored. Uh, George Gilder thinks they weren't a total loss because he thinks at one key point – uh, they did advocate lower taxes for innovators, and, <laughs> and then when they did that, they did something positive. So you know you got to give them credit where credit is due. In the case of DARPA, that's a routine case where um, what was routinely uh, said is that they're responsible for the internet. Well, one of the the key for one of the key people who was responsible for the internet is a guy named Bob Taylor. Bob Taylor was at DARPA, and he was involved in the networking they did. The networking they did which is what people think of when they're thinking this is, is they connected together some very large mainframes at some major research universities. But in terms of internet, what internet uh, means is connecting all the little local area networks around. That's what we think of when we think of what the internet has been. And it, uh, according to what I've been able to find on that, they weren't very interested in doing that. And they weren't doing, they were, it was not high on their agenda to do that. They wanted to connect the scientists you know, Carnegie Mellon wanted to connect with the scientists at Stanford, that they weren't interested in connecting to all these little local area networks, so they weren't developing that. To develop that, that had to come out of Xerox Park. Bob Taylor got so frustrated for a variety of reasons with DARPA, he went to the private sector, and he was the key person behind what had been done in networking with DARPA. And he, he had it with, with DARPA, and he went to Xerox Park, and, there, and he was legendary in pulling in a lot of good people who made a lot of discoveries, things like the mouse, uh, the person who came up with Ethernet, which was a key component to the, to the uh, Internet, was done at Xerox Park with the private money that Xerox provided. And uh, he wrote a memo, a famous memo, because he was so annoyed with people saying that, that DARPA is responsible for the Internet. And he said, no, you're misunderstanding what the Internet is and you're misunderstanding what was key. And I might mention one other, uh, one other uh, uh, example – that uh, uh, she made in the podcast with you, which was that she took credit and gave the government credit for fracking. And I looked into that because I mean, that really puzzled me when I, when I heard that. I thought, that's, that's a real surprise because I'd read this wonderful, wonderful book called The Frackers yep. by Gregory Zuckerman. Gaston Econ And uh, in that, you don't see – I don't, didn't remember having read any key roles – for the government, you, you had he did focus in different chapters on particular innovative entrepreneurs, people like George Mitchell in Texas, and people like uh, Harold Hamm in Enid, Oklahoma, people like that. But these were rough-hewn rednecks who worked their way up through the oil fields and were doing trial and error experiments. I think you mean roughnecks. And, uh, I think not rednecks, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, although, yeah, um, they. Uh, and, and and so I, I looked into what was the source of the claim that uh, uh, the government was important to this. There was somebody who I don't remember being in the frackers too much, but somebody who had worked for Mitchell's group in Texas and who had in some interview had said that the government had done some preliminary research that had been useful. And apparently they had sent some foam down into some of the uh, oil wells somewhere in a study and then published the results, and it had, had some positive effects. He said, though, the way that his quote had been used, and he was annoyed when Obama used it in his um, uh, State of the Union address saying the government was responsible for fracking. When he heard that, he, he, was, he was annoyed. He said, yeah, they, well, some of what they did was useful, but at the end, what he said, at the end of the day, George Mitchell would have developed fracking without the government. The government would not have developed fracking without George Mitchell. And I mean, what entrepreneurs do is entrepreneurs, um, unless they're pure free marketers on principle, they will take resources where they can get them to pursue their dream. So Elon Musk, I think, uh, you know, he's willing to take subsidies to help get his electric car going. Um, but the question is, what's the key? What's the key? What, what are the key people in getting this process going? What would happen was was the government of uh, a uh, 
was it necessary or was it just along for the ride and getting some credit uh, for something that would have happened anyway? And I think with the case of fracking, for sure, and I still don't know what's going to happen with Elon Musk, uh, but with the case of fracking, I think, uh, and the case certainly of the Internet, uh, certainly personal computers, many of the major innovations of our time, the keys were private entrepreneurs and inventors, uh, not the government. Yeah, I think if you're going to make a case uh, for government involvement um, and contribution, I don't think we talked about this with Mariana Mazzucato, but I think the you could argue that some of the um, university systems, the agricultural colleges played an important role in innovations in agriculture. Um, certainly, I don't think we'd have an atomic bomb without the government. Whether we'd have gone to the moon, we wouldn't have gone as soon. Uh, those are the ones that, that you know, come to my mind. But um, I think your earlier point's extremely important here, which is that a lot of times the biggest innovations, the biggest changes, the biggest transformations come from outsiders, uh, people who are skeptical of the received wisdom. And the government structure of research, from my understanding of it at NIH, uh, in um, the NSF as well, the National Science Foundation, uh, it, it tends to have a groupthink issue. It tends to be, as you pointed out with Lord Kelvin, a board of people who represent what we know now. They're very good. They're extraordinary, great scientists um, often. And uh, But their natural impulse is to fund their friends, not literally their friends maybe, but their intellectual friends, the people who think the way they do, and they're not going to be as open uh, to the innovator who's outside the mainstream. And a lot of the money is going through those organizations, so non-mainstream approaches are n- going to struggle to 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 make it. And of course, you know, independent private entrepreneurs have started to fund some of those transformations because they understand that. Um, and I think that's um, that's really important. There's something I have to ask you about because um, sure. you open the book this way, and it's something I've thought about a lot as well, which is. The way we talk about innovation and entrepreneurship when we teach economics, and um, you start off talking personally about that in the book, that it was something that you left out and, and you've, you you regret that. I, I do too. Part of it is there's just not enough time to cover everything you want to talk about, and I found ways to get some types of innovation into some of the uh, ways that I talked about supply and demand uh, in, in my micro classes, but – It is extraordinary that you could get an undergraduate degree in economics and never learn uh, a single thing about entrepreneurship, about what you call leapfrogging, the way that a firm suddenly changes radically the way a consumer desire is satisfied, uh, not just tweaking or improving or lowering the cost of an existing product, but you know, the way the calculator leapfrogged the slide rule. I, you know, these are extraordinary things. And instead, what we pound into our students' heads are things like, so let's, we already, the firm knows what product line it's in. And now we just have to figure out what, how much to produce. Uh, we've, we've, we've stripped away all the interesting things in the name of giving good exam questions. And the things that we can't put into a graph or an equation, we're going to just ignore. And I think it's a terrible disservice. Um, to our to our kids and uh, to our students and to our adults that we don't have a culture of understanding what your book's about. And your book's an attempt to remedy that. And I, I salute it tremendously for that. I think that's, we need a lot more of this. So um, just talk about what you think uh, people should be doing in their classes. What are we missing that we ought to be doing when we teach economics uh, related to entrepreneurship? Well, it's uh, it's hard for individual uh, faculty to unilaterally change this uh, too much because there's these mandated committee decided curriculum that they have to maintain. And I, I sometimes say to my classes, I'm teaching you what is required. And every once in a while, I'm going to sneak in a little bit of what I think really <laughs> matters. And I, I don't. I, I'm not sure I should do that because I, I may be undermining it, uh, the, what I'm doing most of the time, which is teaching the usual stuff. And they may say, well, if Diamond says that, why should we pay attention when he does the spline demand curves? But, but I do that, and I think, I think at le- without saying what I just said, people could sneak in a half an hour here or there and, and talk to them about here are some alternative ways of viewing uh, uh, market structure. 
and here's an alternative views of of uh, viewing uh, what competition is. One of the, one of the points when I when I start the chapter on competition, per, perfect competition, pure competition, I say that uh, now what I'm going to talk about here is the model that economists put up as the paradigm of how capitalism should work when it's working well, and I think that's u- it's useful, but I think that if you're going to use this as your way to judge capitalism, you should think more broadly later in your lives when you're citizens deciding on policies. And you should think about some of the other characteristics of capitalism that are not are not uh, captured by this. <clears throat> and then I show them a, two or three little video clips. <clears throat> I show them uh, um, uh, a clip from uh, the World's Fair in Omaha where they – they lit the – for the first time, people were seeing electric lights, and I see innovation matters. And then I show them a clip of an old ad from eBay where uh, they – there was this little boy on on the beach with his toy boat. And, I love uh, that ad. So I, yes. I love that ad. <laughs> I know you do because the, the source – my source for first finding out about that ad was you <laughs> and a speech you gave at the Appy meetings, uh, one of the plenary sessions. I, I dug it out, and ever since then, every principal's class I teach has been shown your, your toy boat, <laughs> boat ad. But just for, you, for the viewers, if they haven't, or listeners who haven't, who haven't let, me, let me just finish, say this, this ad is wonderful because the boy loses his boat because it floats out to sea when his mother calls him in. He's five the years old. Is, yeah. He's five years old. And then, and then what you see is the boat going out to sea, this little tiny boat, and it's sunk by this huge liner that it runs into it. It goes to the bottom of the ocean. Then it, it flashes to later. A fishing trawling boat pulls up its nets, and there is the boat, and this guy looks at it and ponders. Then the next scene, you see the screen of a computer, and you see on it on eBay, this boat is being offered for sale. And then it flashes back to the person looking at the screen who is the 20 year old version of the kid who had been at the beach and then then the camera goes behind him to a picture of the kid holding his toy boat <laughs> and then the voice intones um what if nothing was ever lost or forgotten uh ebay the power of us all fade to black um and what i say then is um variety matters and Innovations that allow us to have a match between what we want and what's available matters, and those are things that are not captured in the models that we talk about in class. But if you're evaluating the system of free market capitalism, those are characteristics that I hope you'll ponder as you become voters in your life. Um, so I make that kind of point. Um, I don't know how you may – that's how, what individual people can do, that sort of thing. You can sneak things like that in there. Uh, you can be – there's a book that was written, um, Practical Wisdom, where he said to do what you should do in many professions, especially health and education, you need to be a canny outlaw. You have to – I think there's something – isn't that, isn't that terrible that you have to be a canny outlaw to do what you should be doing? But um, how you change these institutions more fundamentally, we talked a lot about health, but sometimes education could use some changes too. But uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I tr- I've been teaching some seminars when they let me where I can talk almost exclusively about the things that mattered. And that's a wonderful thing when you can do that in the core courses. Uh, uh, part of it is uh, part of what I, I, I don't know why this was or what, but, but even the best people like Gary Becker and George Stigler in their price theory texts, when they were talking about what matters and understanding the world in other contexts, they would mention creative destruction uh, there's a wonderful passage in the autobiography, George Sears' autobiography, The Memoirs of an Unregulated Economist, where he talks about how his views changed completely about antitrust. And he says part of it had to do with that McGee paper uh, on Standard Oil. Uh, okay. fi- yeah, John McGee showing that that uh, Standard Oil had not been uh, uh, predatory and that ha- and, and so on. But he then also says, and this is the part that's of most interest to me, is he says – but also we read – some of us read uh, Joseph Schumpeter's Capitalism, Social, and Democracy. And although it was a complete heresy, it had its effects on us. Mm-hmm. So this is heresy, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't put that in the textbooks. You don't put creative instruction in the textbooks or entrepreneurs. But it was something that it mattered. Becker, in his wonderful little textbook that we used in that price theory class that we took, um, it doesn't mention – creative destruction. But when he wrote his columns about practical issues on at least a couple of occasions, 
he found himself needing to use creative destruction to make a case for what made sense to happen in policy. Yeah. So there was a disconnect. We are preserving the – there isn't much change in the price theory text we've used over the decades, even though what we realize when we have to grapple with real po world policy issues, those aren't all the tools we need. We need other concepts and tools. And um, I don't know what to do about it in the broader sense. I know sneak in as an individual professor, sneak in the truth when you can. My guest today has been Arthur Diamond. His book is, get the title right, Openness to Creative Destruction, Sustaining Innovative Dynamism. Our thanks for being part of Econ Talk. I really enjoyed it, Russ. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.